We've had quite a bit already on the subject of Passover. Mr. Burnett has given two sermons on that subject, and I was thinking about some other aspect, because there are a lot of things that one can talk about concerning Passover. But I thought in order to introduce this sermon this afternoon, I'd mention something that a little experience that I had a number of years ago when I was visiting the family home back in London and going through some old photographs. And there were a bunch of old black and white photographs in a box. And I pulled one of them out and I got a sudden shock because there was a photograph. You know, when you look at pictures of people other than yourself, family members, you think to yourself, we look different. But I looked at this picture of a young man and I got a shock. I said, whoa, that looks just like me. <laughs> now it was someone who was very good looking. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it was actually a picture of my father when I believe when he was in his 20s. And I really did get a shock looking at this because the resemblance was uncanny. We don't normally think that we look that much like other members of the family. You know, from the inside out, family members look different. From the outside in, sometimes family members look very similar. This was a little different. I said, whoa, you know, it really was shocking. It looks like me. It wasn't. It was my father as a very, very young man. Now, this all leads into something that I'd like to talk about this afternoon. Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Now, here's a verse that we often read around this time of the year, in the spring prior to the Passover, when we are busy cleaning up our homes and getting the leaven out and preparing for the spring holy days. And here the Apostle Paul gives us an instruction which is very applicable. In 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, he says, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Are we? I hope so. We should be. We want to be. Prove yourselves. Don't you know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? Now, we know about the part about examining ourselves, but there's another part here about Jesus Christ being in us. How much time have we stopped thinking about, have we spent thinking about what that means? Jesus Christ in us. What does it mean? I thought of bringing a set of Russian dolls with me this afternoon. You've all seen Russian dolls. And uh, I don't know how many there are. Sometimes there are four or five of them, beginning with a really little one, and then a little bigger, and then a little bigger, and then a little bigger. Sometimes there's three, sometimes there's four of them. And they all look similar. Russian dolls illustrate the point that I'd like to talk about this afternoon. And that is that Jesus Christ, in a sense, is a Russian doll likeness of God the Father. The scriptures say that. And our goal in life is to become a Russian doll likeness of Jesus Christ. Now, that's a huge undertaking, isn't it? And I think we all acknowledge that we're a work in progress, and we're glad that we have still time to work on ourselves and let God work on ourselves, on us. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Jesus Christ in us. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Therefore, we are to be in Christ. Christ. Christ is in us, and we are to be in Christ. What does that mean? It's one of those vague-sounding phrases that sometimes we read over without stopping to consider it. It has a little bit to do with the Russian doll's uh, analogy. We are, our Christian lives are intended to bring us bit by bit with progress from year to year to the point that we resemble Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Galatians chapter 3 makes a similar point. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. Galatians 3, verses 26 and 27. Galatians 3, verse 26. 
says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We have put on Christ. Christ is in us, and we are in Christ. And again, it sounds a little bit fuzzy-wuzzy, but it really isn't when you think about it. There was a comment about a year ago that I heard Mr. Franks giving a, giving a sermon, and he made a comment, and uh, it's a comment that we've made, I think, in, on many occasions before. He made a very interesting comment. I think it's worth keeping in mind as we approach these spring holy days. He said that when we come to the Passover, sometimes we miss the point. Sometimes we're so busy putting out effort to get the sin out of our lives that we overlook the fact that the purpose of the spring holy days is to put righteousness into our lives. We substitute leavened bread with unleavened bread, and we eat unleavened bread. Now, I think that's a very important point. Uh, it means putting something in, not just taking something out. It's a very important point. When people are struggling with a personal weakness, a personal sin, sometimes the temptation, sometimes the tendency can be standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with that difficulty, uh, WWE wrestling style, and seeing who's going who's gonna to win. And sometimes it doesn't work that way. Sometimes we're much better off if we put something in, something important, something positive, works of righteousness, and not just concentrate on pushing out the sin out of our lives. Nature loves a vacuum. You push the sin out, sometimes it finds its way back in. So it's not just avoiding leaven, but it's also eating unleavened bread, putting on Christ, putting on Christ. Being in Christ is not just a spectator sport. Being in Christ is not just intellectual. How many people have you ever met? I bet you have. You've had this experience, because I have. People that you've talked to who don't share our faith, but who've looked into the Bible, and they say, oh, yeah, I can see the seventh day is a day of worship. That's very plain. Oh, yes, I understand all of that. Oh, yes, I understand about the origins of some of these commonly accepted festivals and so on. I bet you've run into people like that, haven't you? Because I have. Yeah, I understand that. It's very plain. People can see it. Intellectual acquiescence to some of the things that we understand is really pretty easy in some ways. Following through is sometimes a little bit more difficult. Being in Christ, it's not just a spectator sport. It's for active participants. It's something we're involved in. Brethren, being in the church is a, not a spectator sport. It's something we have to be involved in. Uh, sometimes I worry about the fact that our history over the last quarter of a century has sometimes somehow created the impression that being in the church is just a spectator sport. No, being in the church is something you do. You roll up your sleeves and you do something. You contribute to the work of the church. You contribute to your own personal growth. You contribute also to the well-being of the body. Um, I heard somebody say a number of years ago, the church is just an organization. Well, you know, you're hard-pressed to find any statement like that in the Bible. The Bible says no such thing. It's true that the church has organization. But the, my concern is that somehow we kind of flattened our belief in what the church is and our understanding of what it means to be in Christ. All of this means doing something. Doing something that responds to the fact that Jesus Christ paid for the church with his blood. And therefore, the church, the body of Christ, is holy and sacred. The church is imbued with God's Holy Spirit. And the church has a sacred responsibility. It has things that are to be done. I hope we all understand that. I hope our presence here says that. I think somehow we've almost watered down some of that belief. I wonder whether this year at the Passover, we can recommit to that and understand that if we're in the church, we do something. We do something. We're involved. It's, it's, it's not just standing off and watching what other people do. Take a look with me at Galatians chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. Galatians chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. The Apostle Paul writes here to the Galatians who had been uh, overcome by a, by a really strange kind of a heresy that came in in Galatia. But in Galatians 4, verse 19, Paul says, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. 
You begin to look like Christ, like the Russian dolls. I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone. I have doubts about you. Something strange had happened in Galatia. That's, a, that's another subject. But Christ being formed in us, our being in Christ, and Christ being in us, it's a spiritual undertaking. It's a lifelong undertaking. It's not something that we think about only in the spring. It's something that we think about year round. And certainly that Russian doll analogy, well, gonna keep us busy all the way through our entire lives. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter four. I've got quite a bit of scripture this afternoon. There's a lot on this subject. Ephesians chapter four, one of my favorite passages, one of my favorite uh, chapters in the Bible. Ephesians is a wonderful, wonderful book of the New Testament where the Apostle Paul talks about the church and how the church functions and how the church builds itself up in a reciprocal, mutual manner, what it means to be in the church. And it talks, he talks also about the significance of the fact that Jesus Christ is alive and he leads the church and, and grants energy to the church through the power of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, let's pick it up here in verse 7, and I want to read through verse 13. Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 7. But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. We're given grace, unmerited gift, uh, to do something, to accomplish something. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. Isn't this a beautiful passage of scripture? Jesus Christ ascended on high at the right hand of the Father. We need to believe that. We need to believe that and take it very seriously. And from there, he gives gifts to the church so that everybody does something. Everybody contributes to the work of the church. Verse 9, now that this, he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? As you probably know, one of the uh, very damaging heresies in the first century was the heresy of Gnosticism. And one of the claims in this very strange set of beliefs, it seems awfully odd from the perspective of the 21st century, but the claim was that Jesus was not the Christ. They were two separate beings and they weren't one and the same. And I think that uh, Paul is combating that here. Verse 10, he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. There's a job to do. Christ ascended at the right hand of the Father, and from there he empowers and leads and gives us human beings things to do. He gives us roles and responsibilities and gifts, and we're expected to use them for the building up of the body. Verse 11, and he himself, yes, it's emphatic in the Greek, too, he himself, it's emphatic. Paul wanted to get this point across. He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the purpose of building up the church. Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry or for the work of service. He's actually not talking only about the ministry here. He's talking about the entire church. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What a loaded phrase he uses there at the end of verse 13. Are you there yet? I'm sure that none of us are there yet the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is the life to lifelong goal. This is the reason why we're in the church. But note, this isn't the only passage in the, in the New Testament that ties together individual responsibility and collective responsibility of the church. We're to build one another, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And we have, even though, as I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, you know, the world is going through some very, very difficult times at present. Some of the things taking place on the world outside there are pretty chilling and troubling. Uh, and yet, we have a good opportunity now in the church that we have some time of stability when we're not being uh, attacked from the outside or troubled from the inside to make sure we get that right and to take advantage of that opportunity. I want to read just a little bit here from William Barclay's commentary. Uh, on uh, Ephesians, 
Barclay says, he's talking about Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. I'm not going to read all of it, but um, he comments, their aim is that the members of the church should be fully equipped. And he talks about the Greek word used there. The aim, their aim, is that the work of service may go on. He talks about the word used for service, diakonia, service. Everybody serves. Their aim is to see to it that the body of Christ is built up. Always the work of the office bearer is construction, not destruction. His aim is never to make trouble, but always to see that trouble does not rear its head. Always to strengthen, never to loosen the fabric of the church. His aim is that the members of the church should arrive at perfect unity. That's quite a goal as well. He must never allow parties to form in the church, nor do anything that would cause differences in it. His aim is that the members of the church should reach perfect manhood. The church can never be content that her members should live decent, respectable lives. Her aim must be that they should be examples of perfect Christian manhood and womanhood. So Paul ends with an aim without peer. The aim of the church is that her members should reach a stature which can be measured by the fullness of Christ. So the theory is, bit by bit, we look more and more like Jesus Christ from year to year. This is how we define Christian growth. Um, a story about Florence Nightingale. She was passing a hospital ward, and she paused to bend down over a bed of a sorely wounded soldier. As she looked down, the wounded lad looked up and said, You're Christ to me. A saint has been defined as someone in whom Christ lives again. That is what the true church member ought to be. And I don't mean to suggest by that to, that Florence Nightingale was a member of the true church. It's just an illustration. All right, so we've read in the Bible how Christ is in us and we are in Christ. What does that mean? In practical terms, what does that mean? Because if we're not careful, it almost sounds vague. It sounds something we have difficulty getting a handle on. What does it mean? I'd like to take a look at some of the aspects of what Jesus Christ did and what he does in an ongoing way, what he did when he was here on earth. And for us to stop and ask ourselves, how do we measure up to Christ and that, that phrase that Paul uses in Ephesians 4, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And if that makes all of us feel just a little inadequate, well, I think that's the purpose of the scriptures that we're going to take a look at. Um, did you ever stop to think about Jesus Christ and God the Father in prehistory. Let's go to John chapter 17 and verse 5. John 17 and verse 5. Come to the Passover um, every year, and very likely we read this section of the Scripture. There's so much to be said about this, but one of the things that's so striking is the preexistence of Jesus Christ with the Father. John 17 verse 5 makes this point. He says, And now, O Father, <clears throat> glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. It's a difficult concept, isn't it? I don't know how you relate to that, but I, I read that one. I thought about it many, many times and tried to think about Jesus Christ with God the Father down through eternity and that he was in glory. And the point being here that he gave up his glory. He gave up his spiritual existence. In a sense, he gave up that eternal, non-physical existence in order to come down to earth and to become our Savior and to give up his life and to found the church. I'm sure he knew very, very well the Old Testament scriptures. In one sense, of course, he actually wrote them. Now, he knew from, for example, the prophecies of Isaiah 4, 53, what it was going to be like, how painful it was going to be when he went through that terrible crucifixion, that awful uh, suffering that he went through before he actually gave up his life and was in the grave for 72 hours before the Father resurrected him. The point I'm trying to get at here is that it must have been an enormous decision concerning submission, submission of his will. I think this is one of the aspects of being in Christ. Submitting one's own will. Let's go to the prayer in the garden in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. When you keep in mind the fact that our Savior knew all of those prophecies, and he knew the prophecies about how badly 
Messiah had to suffer when he came to earth. Those things, I'm sure, were on his mind when he presents this prayer before God, and he says, essentially, is there some other way that this can be done? Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 36. Matthew 26, beginning in verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. You know, he was human after all. He wasn't sinful. He didn't have sin, but he was human, and he'd come in human flesh. And that distress was based partly on the very clear knowledge of what was approaching. He knew what was coming. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly so sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And the father, of course, knew what he was referring to. Is there some other way we can fulfill the plan? Very much alone, very much in close communion with the father, knowing what the Father and Jesus Christ together had planned through prehistory, and he says to the Father, can this be done some other way? Because he knew what it meant. Verse 40, and he came to the disciples and found them asleep and said to Peter, what, couldn't you watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Isn't that the case? Sometimes we get sleepy. Sometimes we're concerned about our own physical well-being. Verse 42, he went away again a second time and prayed and said, O oh my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. It was the will of the Father. It was pre-planned. Here Jesus Christ in the human flesh says, is there some other way that it can be done? Verse 43, and he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Now, he knew what was coming. He knew how painful it was going to be. You know, when, when we talk about these subjects, it's always a bit of a dilemma, because what our Savior went through was miserable and really very, very painful. And, you know, preachers always have this dilemma how much in the area of, uh, of, the, of the unpleasantness and the blood and so on that he went through should one even describe, you know, in, a, in a, a church service like this where we've got lots of people and children and so on. It was a very, very painful death. The uh, Roman half death with the scourging. He knew what was going to take place because he knew the prophecies. He knew what they would do when they would take this leather band, this lictor, with knots in it and little pieces of bone or little pieces of metal and bring it down on the body of God in the flesh, the Savior, to bring him to as much suffering as possible and as much pain as possible, just short of death. It was referred to as the Roman half death. And I won't get any more graphic than that, but uh, take a look at it when, if you, when you get home tonight, if you'd like to take a look at it. Get to look for the matter of the Roman scourging. It was a terrible, terrible thing, a miserably cruel thing to do to any human being, and he knew what was approaching. He knew he was going to be spat upon. He knew they were going to put a crown on his head and mock him, a crown of thorns, and he knew he was going to hang on the stake with the nails through his hands and his ankles, and they were going to give him a drink of, offer him a drink of sour wine and gall. He knew what was coming. Now, I think what's most remarkable about all of this is not just the physical suffering, but also the fact that he gave up his will. And so one of the things that I think we should think about at this time of, of the year, how good are we at this? What are we like? Let's read one other verse in Philippians 2, verse 14. Philippians 2, verse 14. I've come to believe that this is one of the most difficult aspects of the Christian life. I think every one of us from time to time battles with our own will. Should we battle a little harder? It's a question worth asking ourselves, isn't it? Should we battle a little harder? If he willingly went through with that, with all of that terrible suffering, and we make a fuss at times about little, little things that cause a little bit of discomfort, I wonder. I wonder about it with myself. I wonder about it with many of us.
Philippians 2 verse 14 says, do all things without murmuring and disputing. My observation, having been in the church for quite some length of time, many years now, is that this whole matter of self-will has caused lots of problems in God's church. Lots of problems. People can easily be self-willed. Self-will is a function of the flesh, giving up one's will, giving up one's own will, and saying, let the will of God be done in my life is a tough thing to do. In some ways, it's the most difficult thing that a Christian can ever do. How good are we at that? How good are we at that? The character of Jesus Christ was really, truly beautiful character. That's our goal. That's your goal. That's my goal. You know, <clears throat> I think about having seen people, the saints of God, who exhibited this and showed really a kind of a character, a demonstrable character that made me stop and think. And my mind goes back to the time when I was in Pasadena, California, before I was ordained, and uh, uh, there, uh, that beautiful campus that we had there. And on that campus, they used to have a number of church members, baptized members of the Church of God. And these were the shut-ins. And they assigned several of us young men to go and visit the shut-ins with some of the other ministers. And um, I'll never forget the very first time, I think it may have been the very first time, when I heard one gentleman, a member of the body of Christ, and I sat next to his bedside, and I heard him say something that I think will always stay with me. I hope to see this man again sometime shortly. But he was suffering with cancer, and he said, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to suffer a whole lot of pain. And uh, there were others as well. I still remember the names. I've got their names in my notes, but I'm not going to read off all of the names of some of those people. But I realized at the time, something that I think many of us have seen, that the most beautiful examples of character in some of God's people are at that stage in life, where they are come to the point where they have to be willing to relinquish this physical life, letting go giving up of one's own will. Again, I pose the question, how good are we at that? Have we made progress? Are we better at it? We're not talking here about never enjoying life. We're not talking about asceticism. We're talking about saying to God, thy will be done, not my will be done. Some of those cancer patients back in the 1980s in Southern California taught me a lesson. And Jesus Christ teaches us a lesson as well. But let's move on because we're talking about aspects of the character of Jesus Christ. And let's go to John chapter 13. John 13 and verse 1. John chapter 13 and verse 1. <clears throat> and here I think is another area where we are all, we've all got the goal of growing to that measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. John 13 verse 1. Um, we heard about the night to be observed. Here's, of course, part of the Passover, the evening before, a New Testament Passover, which involves a washing of feet. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Talks a lot about love, doesn't it? And again, love is one of those very abstract terms for us to think about, especially as we come down to the spring holy days and we think about the example that our Savior set for us. How do we define that? How do we define love, Christian love, that comes from the Spirit of God? Outgoing concern, putting others before oneself. John 13, verses 34 and 35, much later in the chapter. John 13 verses 34 and 35, Jesus defines this for us, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now, you know, if there is ever a scripture and a goal that is something for the entire body to make greater effort about and move toward individually and collectively. Verse 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. People are going to recognize it. I think we've made progress. I hope we have. I hope we're better at it. Uh, what does it mean? 
What does it mean to love others? When we really love our brothers and sisters in the faith, I think we can define it as doing things, doing actions that are in the interests of other people, not thinking about ourselves. We live in the big city of Dallas. We see people running around, making money, looking after themselves, competing with one another, elbowing one another out of the way. But from time to time, a Christian says, you know, this goes against my interests. This isn't in my own selfish interests, but I'll go ahead and do it anyway. Why? Because it's the right thing to do, because it's honorable, and because it shows love for other people. Take a look at the statement of John the Baptist in John 3, verse 30. John chapter 3 and verse 30. Interesting, the relationship between the Baptist and, and the Christ. John 3 and verse 30, John makes a statement here. He knew his work was coming to an end. He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. The work of Christ was beginning to increase. He was coming on the scene. There was some overlap, of course. John's work was coming to an end. He says, okay, I'm willing to pass the baton. I'm only here, after all, only just to prepare the way for him. John 16, verse 7. John 16, verse 7, Jesus himself says, Something along these lines, an important statement. John 16, verse 7, they were all worried. They were sorrowful. John 16, verse 7, Jesus here says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. If I don't go away, the helper, the comforter, the paraclete will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him it more accurately to you. So Jesus here makes a statement. Yeah, I know you're all worried about this. I know you're upset. You call me Lord and Master. I've got to go. I've got to go because if I don't go and give up my life, if we don't go through this phase of God's plan, the Holy Spirit can't come. And of course, really a lot of this whole section of John's gospel was for the purpose of preparing them. You read through that whole section, I hope we will, between now and the Passover and perhaps, that, of course, that same evening we read big chunks of this uh, section of scripture. And a lot of it was for the purpose of preparing them, getting ready. The church is about to be found, founded, the Holy Spirit is going to come, the Comforter, the Paraclete, and that Spirit will be with you and it will lead you. It's quite a story. So Jesus Christ himself emphasizing something here that he had to go away uh, because otherwise they couldn't receive the Holy Spirit. And of course, it's the Holy Spirit that makes us children of God. It makes us part of God's family. We think of this Sometimes we think of the Passover, when we go to the Passover, we think of it in very individual terms. We think of our uh, own individual relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And in one sense, it's true. The Passover is very individual. We look at ourselves individually. We examine ourselves. We sometimes get a little frustrated and we you know, wonder, how much have I grown? Uh, it is individual for baptized members of the church, but it's not only individual. It involves others. It involves mem other members of the body of Christ as well. I remember a man many years ago whom I knew, and he used to have something. I heard him say it on more than one occasion. Think about this statement for, for a moment here. This man said, I remember him saying it, the only relationship that matters is the vertical relationship. The only relationship that matters is the vertical relationship. I hope you can all see what he meant by that. What he was saying was, the only relationship that matters is your individual relationship with God. Is it true? Now, in actual fact, this particular gentleman was frankly not very good at horizontal relationships. But the scriptures don't say that. Even when we come to the Passover, individual as that is and personal as that is, it's not only vertical. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 1 Corinthians 10, verses 16 and 17. A couple of verses, again, that we can overlook if we're not careful. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 16 and 17. When we come to the Passover, we're not just reaffirming our own personal commitment to God and to Jesus Christ. We're also reaffirming our commitment to our brothers and sisters in the faith and to the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16 says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? 
The word for communion used here is koinonia, commonness, commonness, fellowship, the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So when we have that little piece of bread and that little glass of wine at the Passover, it's not just us saying to God, yeah, I'm still committed to it, God. I'm still here. I'm still striving to grow individually. It's also our acknowledgement of the fact that we're part of a body and we've got a responsibility to the body as a whole. Verse 17, for we being many are one bread and one body. We all partake of that one bread, the same bread. We confess that we've got one Lord. We confess that we've got the same spirit. We confess that we're headed in the same direction together. And we help one another to grow from time to time. So uh, that old friend of mine, I think, was very, very wrong. He had it wrong. It's not true that the only relationship that matters is the vertical relationship. In fact, if the vertical relationship is healthy, then the other relationships, the horizontal relationships, are healthy as well. Both need to be healthy. The one reflects the other. So how often do we act in the interest of someone other than ourselves? How often do we do something on behalf of others? This really is Christian character. How often do we do those things? Philippians 2 and verse 4. Philippians 2 and verse 4. Our Savior did, of course. Philippians 2 and verse 4. Paul writes to the church here in, in Philippians. Philippians 2 verse 4. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. I think we've got better at it. I do. I really believe that we've got better at it. From the time that I came into the church until now, the year 2019, I think the church has made progress. I'd like to think I've gotten a little better at it. I think many of us, the body generally, we've made progress, but I also think we've got a long way to go. It's the same bread. It's the same wine. It's that commitment to serve and help and think about other people other than ourselves. You know, society makes it so easy for us just to think about ourselves, encourages us to think about ourselves, but the Passover comes around in the days of unleavened bread, and we're encouraged to do what Christ did, to think about others. Let's go now to John chapter 15. I'd like to go to another aspect of what it is to be in Christ and to be growing in Christ. In John 15, and verses 19 and 20. See, these terms have definition to them. John 15, verse 19. Let's begin, pick it up in verse 18. John 15, verse 18. Jesus here makes a very interesting comment. He says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you're going to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, don't expect you're always going to get a round of applause from the world around you. Verse 8, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Verse 20, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. I think if we had lived in Europe in the Middle Ages and been members of the Church of God back then, those words would have had a much greater impact on us. Because, you know, we're in the United States of America and it's the year 2019 and we just get in our cars and we come to services. We go down to the Passover service. We talk about where we're going to go for the Feast of Tabernacles. We talk about the night to be observed and what a nice evening we're going to have and a good dinner and talk about how we came into the church. And we haven't really faced a whole lot of this, have we? Any of you catch in the news yesterday, I think it was yesterday, there was a story about, did you catch a news story about Chick-fil-A in San Antonio Airport? You can check it online if you want to. Uh, there is a report that the airport in San Antonio, Texas has denied a franchise to the Chick-fil-A chain of restaurants. And you can probably guess why. This was the, the rumor, and of course people are pushing back on it, but the idea was, well, Chick-fil-A is a Christian organization and we don't want them here and you know, people are opposed to them. Yeah, it's a fairly mild example of things that sometimes take place and have taken place that are much more serious. Most of us have not really faced persecution. 
Um, there are other parts of the world where the church has struggled to do some of the things that we can do very easily here in the US. Parts of the world where the church has not been able to register because very big religious entities don't want little religious groups like us to be registered. And in a sense, the kind of freedoms that we have in the world as we experience it right now, it's almost an unnatural state. I hope we realize that. It's a real, really, really great blessing to live in the United States of America where we have our religious freedoms. Um, it's unnatural. It's the exception. We wonder about the future. But I'd like to take you here to um, 1 Peter 2, verse 21. 1 Peter 2, verse 21. We always used to think that persecution would come on the church in this country because of our commitment to Seventh-day Sabbath keeping. But if you talk to a lot of people, you know, uh, well, you go to church on Saturday, we go to church on Sunday, fine. You, do, you got yours, I got mine. I've come to the conclusion that may not be the source of the opposition that the church will have. Um, it may, there are other things in the culture right now, the stands that Christians and this body of people have to take. First Peter 2 and verse 21 1 Peter 2 and verse 21. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Sometimes we, we read that and we perhaps misread it a little bit. We're to live a righteous life as he did. Well, we are. Certainly many scriptures say that, but the context here is that he suffered. He suffered persecution for what he represented. And really most of us have not come across that. I want to draw your attention to something here uh, that has always intrigued me in the scriptures uh, because we have a number of examples in the New Testament of individuals actually being persecuted in much the same way that Jesus Christ himself was persecuted. John 18, let's go to John chapter 18 and verse 19. John chapter 18 and verse 19. John 18 verse 19. Up through verse 23. John 18, verse 19. The high priest asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered, answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who've heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And when he had said those things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand. It was not the only time he suffered an act of violence, saying, do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, if I've spoken evil, bear witness of the evil, but if well, why do you strike me? Now, let's go forward to Acts chapter 23. Acts 23, because it's so interesting. Jesus said, you know, you're going to be mistreated the way I've been mistreated. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 23, beginning in verse 1, Acts 23, verse 1. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Talk about Russian dolls. Same thing happened to Paul that happened to Jesus Christ. Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Now, you know the story. After Paul essentially uh, uh, railed on him, he uh, or reviled him, then he had to take a step back and apologize for it. You sit to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? Paul, in a sense, made a mistake here, but he too suffered persecution for the things that he stood for. So enduring opposition, enduring opposition, Something that we've not had to do a whole lot of. Some of the opposition that we've had in the church has been really pretty mild by comparison with what our predecessors in the faith went through in the first century and down through the ages. We have this tremendous blessing of living in the United States of America. As you know, I was born in another, in another country, and you know, most of Western Europe has religious freedom, but I had an interesting conversation with a group of um, Christian ladies, and I use the term Christian in the broad sense. I was on a flight within Europe, and we got to talking, uh, and they asked me what I do for a living, and I explained that I'm a Bible teacher. I was born in England, and I, uh, my work in the United States is a Bible teacher, and we got to talking about the UK, 
and about England. And, uh, you know, of course, it's a free country. People can go to church or go to a synagogue or go to a mosque as they choose. But they made a very interesting point. They said, well, culturally, culturally, there is opposition to Christianity in Britain that there isn't in many parts of the United States. And I thought about that. Now, if you've ever been to Western Europe, that's true. Culturally, there is opposition. People who believe in some variety of Christianity are kind of looked down on as if it's got sort of a superstition. Uh, and certainly here in the southern parts of the United States, that's nearly, not nearly quite so much. So Jesus Christ endured opposition. How good are we at enduring opposition? Part of the process of growing in Christ. John chapter 10, John chapter 10, John chapter 10, putting on Christ, finally, involves commitment, commitment. John 10, verses 28 through 30. John 10, verses 28 through 30. John 10, verse 28. Jesus here says, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Nobody can snatch you, me, out of the hand of Jesus Christ. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. I've always read that and thought, what a tremendous statement. It tells us that Jesus Christ, our Savior, is fully committed to our, our salvation. No one can snatch us out of the hand of Jesus Christ. It's impossible. People can try, but they can't do it. The individual can. You can. I can. Allow, allow ourselves to be snatched out of the hand of Jesus Christ. And some have done that, of course. But no one can do that against him. And, uh, of course, we get to this time of the year when we come to the Passover again. And this is a time to strengthen our commitment to Jesus Christ. All of us who are baptized members at some point in the past sat in, sat in front of a minister who asked us the following question. Have you counted the cost? Have we? Recount the cost. Think about it every year. Think about our commitment. Think about how deeply committed we are and deepen our commitment to the way of life that God has called us to. I was thinking for this sermon of going back over some of the examples in the Old Testament. There's a lot in the Old Testament about Old Testament Passovers. Uh, I'm not going to take the time to go through them all, but let's just list off a few of them. Every time the Passover comes around in the Old Testament, it's a time of rededication. Hezekiah had a Passover, and he invited the people from the northern kingdom to cross the border and come down to Jerusalem and recommit themselves to God. And some of them, you know, it really took courage to do that. Some of them came down across the border to Jerusalem and recommitted to God in a wonderful moment of rededication and recommitment. King Josiah, the last one of the great kings of Judah who led them in a reform, also a tremendous time of rededication with an enormous Passover ceremony, a joyous Passover ceremony. And then after they'd all come back, there's, there's Ezra as well, who also did, did, led them in rededication. And so Passover is a time of rededication and recommitment. Jesus says, no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. But we can allow ourselves to be snatched out of the Father's hand if we're not careful. So when we go to the Passover this year, and when we come to the Days of Unleavened Bread, it's about recommitment. It's about rededication. How deep is our dedication. I used to think in my first few Passovers in the church that every time I went into the Passover service that there had to be some sort of emotional feeling to it, that it was based on emotion. And I suppose there is an emotion involved in taking that bread and wine every year and recommitting to God, but I came to realize as time went by, no, emotion is really not the center of all of this. It's really not the big thing for each member of the church. It's not about emotion. It's about commitment, decisiveness, determining where our lives are going to go with God's help. It's about gratitude to God that Jesus Christ is alive and that he's our Savior. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus emphasizes this, Luke 22, 
and verse 14, Luke 22 and verse 14 through verse 16, desire. Luke 22, verse 14, he makes an interesting comment here. Luke 22, verse 14, when the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him, and he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Desire. He wanted to eat that Passover. He was committed to it. Our Savior is committed to us. How committed are we? How committed are we? How deep does our commitment go? John chapter 6. John chapter 6, again, passages that we read at the Passover service. John 6, beginning in verse 53, verses 53 and 54. John 6, 53 and 54. Whoever eats my flesh, verse 53, most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. We have to go and keep the Passover. Otherwise, there's no life. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Read John's Gospel sometime over the next three weeks. Go through that section where he talks about the Passover. He's drawing attention to the fact that the Israelites ate the manna in the wilderness, and it sustained them physically. But they went to their graves, and it was over. And he says, look, if you really belong to me, to Jesus Christ, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood so you may receive eternal life. I bet we've all looked at that at times and thought about it and tried to weigh out in our minds the, the weight and the magnitude of what all that means. Jesus Christ is committed to us. It's an ongoing commitment. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11. His commitment doesn't waver. It's ongoing. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. It's an important passage here in 1 Corinthians 11 because this is the only place in the New Testament where there are instructions from an apostle to a New Testament congregation about keeping the New Testament Passover. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23, Paul says, I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Sometimes people get to this time of the year, and they look at themselves, and they get discouraged, and they say, Oh, I've got these weaknesses. Oh, I'm struggling with this. I can't go and keep the Passover. It's a command. It's a command. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. He did it willingly. He's committed to it. Verse 25, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We go to the Passover. We're to have him on our mind, our Savior. And then verse 26, and there's a, an important little point here at the end of verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Passover has a backward-looking aspect to it. The slaying of those Passover lambs in ancient Israel was a figure of the work of Jesus Christ. There's an annual celebration of the Passover, but those little three words in verse 26, think about that when you're sitting there with your Bible in your lap at the Passover this year, and you're about to take the bread and to drink the wine. We proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. What we say is we're committed to it. We know it's about the future as well, and we'll keep on doing this until our Lord comes back. We're committed to it just as he is. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Christ is committed. We must be too. It's a time to solidify our commitment. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8. Paul says, Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. <clears throat> 
Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The scriptures tell us to put on Christ. We're supposed to be like those Russian dolls. Bit by bit, every year, we look a little bit more like him. That commitment, that love, that willingness to do what is necessary. It's more than just avoiding leaven. It's not just putting the leaven out of our lives. It's eating unleavened bread. And every year, year to year, putting on a little more of the character of Jesus Christ. Let's have some good spring holy days. <laughs>